Hi, and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. Uh, this week, a bit of a special one, as you can see, I don't have an Anna, I have a G Afton instead. Now, we've been asking for some questions from all of you lovely viewers online, and we've got a whole bunch of questions we're going to ask directly to G right now. I've literally copied and pasted these. This is the least amount of work I've ever had to do on one of these shows. This is great. Uh, there's some very random questions in here that I may or may not ask. We'll deal with these when we get there. Um, Gee, first question is from a regular, Tim Sadler, and he says, do you miss having a colourful bike? Uh, and you put in brackets, a brighter bike would pop more in pictures. Well, that's true. Good point, it would. <clears throat> but at the moment, everything we're doing is purely focused on performance from the bike, which, you know, the paint job doesn't have a huge impact on. So black is as far as we've got with it so far. You seem like a guy that likes an all-black bike. Yeah, quite black's my favourite. All raw, so they're the two options so far. I would go raw, personally. Yeah. But I think that's because I was quite drawn to the way it was made, and I just loved enough to see it. It's cool it's seeing not... the titanium as well. Yeah. It's such a you know unique colour, but I like the black. Uh, what would you guys have out there, by the way? Would you go for a black option or the raw? Uh, let us know down below. Okay, uh, Pete Tompkins <coughs> has commented, and I think it is actually that Pete Tompkins. The Pete Tompkins. Uh, of crud fame, Thank who you, invented... The crud catcher, basically, uh, an early mud god. He said, when are the e-bikes coming out? I think that's probably quite a, a question you get asked quite a lot. Yeah, are it they, is. Is it even a thing? Yeah, well, it's a conversation. It's not a bike yet. But, I mean, we have been talking about it. Obviously, we need to because e-bikes are sick and they're a lot of fun. But so far, we've got the downhill bike. We've got the 130. We've got the 150. We're just bringing out a new bike, but not an e-bike yet. Interesting. Um, I do know that you've got some amazing riding on the doorstep that's not just at the bike park. Uh, you've got a massive enduro loop, haven't you? We have. Out that way. And Is that like so, an e-bike style enduro loop? It's built for e-bikes. You know, you're pedaling up, you come out the top of the bike park and you're climbing up even further to the very top of the mountain and then you can kind of traverse across ridges, long downhill track, and then there's like a 20 minute kind of enduro downhill loop. Minute. Which is okay. sick, literally perfect for an e-bike. And we have got e-bikes, but not our own. Interesting. Watch this space. A um, <clears throat> bit more titanium sort of basis now. So MTB DK says, how many titanium parts does G contain? <laughs> <laughs> well, probably a similar amount to our frames. <clears throat> I mean, at the moment from the last crash, it was titanium plates and screws in the wrist, titanium rod and screws in the femur, yeah. which has been upgraded to a, a bigger one. So we've got a bit stronger. What's, what's the theory of that? can just land a bigger jumps. And that stays takes in. Some, takes some bigger hits, yeah. Reinforced. <sighs> Pretty gnarly. Okay, next question. Um, about costing, actually, from Callum J. Smith, who's asking, like, you know, are, are the costs likely to come down? So it's obviously such a laborious process that I've seen, and the amount of people, well, the not many amount of people that actually work on putting a frame together. So I'm, I'm not sure how you could do that, to be honest. I mean, the price at the moment, you know, it, it is what it is so far. You know, it's a hand-built bit of kit, a bike that's going to last a long time. The price is kind of where we expected it would be. But as that additive manufacturing process becomes more efficient, it means the frames are getting made quicker gradually. As that technology advances, the frame price will come down. Also, something I can't talk about too much, but in the future, there might be different price options. Interesting. So there could well be something else going on behind the scenes we don't know about yet. Um, I'm going to pick at him to find out a bit more about that <laughs> later. Uh, next up from Joshua West. How long does it take to make a complete frame from scratch um, from when materials arrive to the factory to a usable finished frame? I mean, we kind of covered that a little bit in the video, but a, a good recap if you want to go into that. Yeah, well, you know, you can literally follow that process from the back door where, you know, bags of titanium dust get delivered to the front door where you're wheeling out a brand new AM150. Um, it's about 18 hours in the actual 3D printing machine itself to actually build the lug set. And then added to that, you've got, you know, the, the, the fettling of the lugs, the blasting to take the edges off and smooth them, the treatment. The, the curing time, you know, it does add up, but it's a process we're getting better at every week and it is gradually speeding up. You know, wait times for a bike are a bit longer than we'd want them right now, but 
again, it's something that's coming down and gradually getting shorter and shorter. Yeah, I guess you just improve it as yeah. you're, you're building on the business. Um, do you know, when I actually came out to see you all, I was shocked at you know how much time it took to build the frame and how few people actually do it. But a few other things since I visited you have put time into perspective. I went to see the team at Fat Creations to do paint jobs, and they do 15 hours just to prep on a frame before painting it. That's not even building the frame or doing anything else. Yeah, I mean... So I don't see it as much time. Yeah, it's it's not long in the grand scheme of things. And again, you know, it comes back to what I was saying earlier. Everything we're doing is focused on performance. You know, if if it can make the bike better, stronger, lighter, more durable, we're going to do it, you know. And we're not going to start sacrificing that to try and bring time down on a frame build. Which is, which is a great way to do it. Um, and speaking of the strength, actually, Kyan mm. Raymond asks, um, how much stronger is additive manufactured frame? I think the entire approach to the way you build a carbon frame uh, compared to a regular carbon frame. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I'm gonna say it's a lot stronger. You know, because the materials we're using are the right material for the right place. For example, carbon tubing is good when the forces are, are you know, quite straight, quite simple, so it's strong for a down tube or a top tube, etc. Whereas titanium is very strong when the forces are complex. You know, there's there's twisting, there's torsion coming from different directions. So we can put the titanium, you know, a head tube, a BB, where it needs to be strong from a lot of different directions. And then obviously with the bonding together, you know, you've you've got a frame that isn't going to reach. You know, it's the forces that are going to take the break in. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a fascinating way to build a bike. So what you probably can't see from there, but on the inside of these lugs, uh, there's almost like buttresses on the inside, and that's kind of how you tailor the stiffness, isn't it, and the strength of each one? Yeah, exactly. And we can either add or or take them out, depending, you know, if it's a downhill frame, we need it a bit stronger, and it can be a bit heavier, or if it's the 130, we can lighten it and, and take a few out. Yeah, whereas with the more traditional <clears throat> carbon frame approach that come out of a mould, um, there's not too much more you can do. You get the different layup at the different angles of carbon, uh, other than putting more carbon on there. There's not too much you can do in terms of tuning it. Well, this is it. On an all carbon frame, when you're laying up carbon, the only way to, to make it stronger is just to layer it up and make it thicker and thicker and thicker, mm. you know, making the bike heavier and still not as strong as you'd like it to be in certain areas. Um, next up from <clears throat> Andy from the trail side, who asks, have you got any plans for showrooms or perhaps ways of seeing the bikes in different places around the world, like trail parks or bike parks or something? I think it'd be kind of nice for people to see them. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to get your head around what they look like until you see them. Yeah, exactly. And we know this is something we need to focus on because exactly like you said, you need to see it. You need to be able to sit on it. And I think they look better in the flesh than on pictures. Yep. You know, you, you see the, the, the fine details that you might not otherwise see. So we need to figure out ways to get them around the world, get them to different places. At the moment, you know, the race team traveling around, that's a, a main way people can see them in different parts of the world. Um, obviously at the bike park in Dovey, but not everyone can get there. So watch this space. Um, next us from <coughs> Chef Simon Davis. I'm pretty sure that's DJ Estrop that I've played with before. A great DJ and he's a really good chef as well. He's asking about running O-Chain devices. He's asked, are you running it because just performance or is there like a kickback in the design that makes you want to run them? I mean, I, we, we talk about O-Chains quite a lot because suddenly a lot of downhill racers have started using them and some enduro racers. It's something we mainly just use uh, for the race team. And, you know, those guys... It's very much a personal preference thing. Mm -hmm. We find, you know, when you're just riding the, the bike at the park or just local trails, we don't use them. But for the race team, they're looking for every performance Im improvement they can. And, you know, it's down to personal preference as well. Absolutely. Yeah, there's no right or wrong with that sort of thing. <coughs> um, a couple of people actually are asking, will there be an Atherton Bikes hardtail? I mean, flipping neck, that'd be a pretty rowdy, expensive hardtail if there was. I would love it if there there was. So far, no plans, but, you know. You'll be got... tempted to be like, Gordon, knock us up our tail. Well, we could, you know. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be impossible. So I think it would be sick as well. Literally, you know, as you're looking at the bike currently, but without the suspension platform, 
that would be perfect. It could look mega, actually. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, real nice. And real interesting question here, because we, we're on the Dirt Shed Show. In fact, mm. if you've not seen it, there'll be a link to the Dirt Shed Show that G was on recently. And we were talking about the mindset and just approaching cycling. So someone here is talking about the weight limit. Um, he says, is there a maximum weight limit on the bikes or is there a known impact force that the frame can't handle? And it kind of ties in with us talking about, you know, believing in the product. Weight limit for the rider? Yeah, I, I guess weight limit for the rider or a known impact force that the frame can't handle. Uh, so far, no. And, you know, we, we test the bikes to obviously find out what that kind of absolute maximum force is that the, the, the frame can reach before failure. And obviously they, they know what it is kind of, you know, during testing, etc. But it's nowhere near what you can get to from a, from a riding point of view. Has anyone managed to break one yet in like no. all that testing stuff? And we've not been breaking them, and they've been, you know, they've been ridden a lot now and for a long time. And you know, I've I've been trying my hardest. <laughs> I've definitely been breaking yeah. before before the bikes have been. Yeah, <laughs> not, not ideal. And um, what they're like in durability terms. So now a lot of the viewers, if they were going to look at buying a carbon bike, one of the first things you think of is like you crash the bike, you take a chunk out of the carbon. Is it written off? Obviously, because the mix is a little bit different in the way they use different carbon tubes. Well, the way we get around that is the bikes are built with, you know, a fatigue limit. So there's a certain force that if the bike's been taken over regularly, it will break. Mm -hmm. So the way to get around that is to make sure even under an enormous impact, a heavy load, you can't get anywhere near that fatigue limit. Next question, um, how and why did Atherton Bikes come up with the approach of 3D printing frame parts? We wanted to create something that was different. We wanted to create something that, we wanted to create bikes that we would want to ride at different points of our career. You know, we spent our whole lives riding for other companies, <clears throat> sometimes good, sometimes, you know, not as impressive. So you gradually learn what you want from what a frame like. and, and you, yeah. what you want it to do for you. And as we learned more about that additive manufacturing process, you know, we realized it was just ticking more and more boxes for being an incredible process for making bikes. You know, it allowed us the freedom to, to, to be able to make changes quickly to, to prototype, you know, so rapidly, but at the same time deliver a bike that you can make as strong as you possibly could want it to be. You know, we've been, spent our lives hammering bikes, been a bit disappointed that they couldn't quite keep up with our sure. riding, you know. You want a bike that's going to be able to do everything you can do and more, and this is what we came across. Do, do you think, um, just going back on <clears> that <throat> point, um, and no, no disrespect to any of the brands you've ever ridden for, but do you think part of that is because they're developing a bike to sell, not just as a bike to race that you then sell? So it kind of feels like the way you were building bikes that you want to ride, uh, hey, you can buy them now. Feels like a bit of a different approach. Yeah, definitely. You know, the, the typical way of making bikes isn't because that's the very best way to make a bike. It's because it's the best way to sell bikes on a large scale to a lot of people quickly with a good margin. Whereas we wanted to build bikes in a way that was the very best way to build a bike and then make the business side work around that. Sure. That's, that's great. Yeah, no one else does it that way. Um, and a couple more <coughs> questions just about the sort of frame sets themselves. So uh, Ter Sizen says, what's the theoretical limiting <coughs> factor in the lifetime of the frame? Uh, glue, carbon, or stress cycles on the tie? Uh, I guess what it means is what, what would be the weakest sort of entity there? Out of the I mean, if I had to pick, it would be hard to pick one part of those kind of, of, of the three, whether it's the, the titanium lug, the carbon tubing, or the, the, the bonded double lap shear joint, it would depend on the force, and a different force would be difficult on different parts. But it comes back to what I was saying earlier. You know, each, each part and, and the parts combined have a fatigue limit, and as long as we know that you can't get near that fatigue limit, let alone repeatedly yeah, again and fine. again. You know, you're not going to find a titanium lug suddenly failing or, or one of the double lap shear joints suddenly failing. Um, okay, G, amazing selection of questions there. Thank you for everyone getting involved there. I guess the last thing to ask is, 
We've seen the 150, we've seen the 130, which that would be the one I would have out of all the bikes. Um, what bike would you have, or maybe there's a bike that doesn't exist yet that you would have? Well, the timing of that question is very good. We've literally just got to the point we're ready to release the next bike in the series, which is going to be the AM170 170mm travel park bike. 27, 29, probably going to be my favourite bike, to be honest. And was that, am I right in thinking it was kind of Dan that's kind of spearheaded that bike, the bike he's been looking for? Absolutely, yeah. You know, he's created this incredible bike park up at Dovey, so we needed the bike to go with it, and that's what this 170 is going to be. Awesome stuff. Uh, don't forget, if you want to find out more about Atherton Bikes, there's going to be a link to the website down there. And there's also going to be the video I filmed up at Atherton Bikes with G, uh, seeing the entire process of how the bikes are made. Uh, if you haven't seen that, you should watch it. It's, uh, it's really cool. Uh, thank you, G, for joining us on the show. If you've got any questions for G off the back of this, uh, get involved down there. And we'll see you another Ask soon. Thanks for watching. Cheers, guys.